Wow, there's more than enough. That's good news. That is good news. Um, well, as Rob mentioned, my name's Brendan. I'm a pastor in training here at Spirit and Truth. We lead a house church on Thursday nights. So, yeah, if you haven't joined a house church, let me know. And uh, if we haven't met, yeah, please come say hi. Um, wow, I'm just honestly honored and humbled to be here, honored to be able to share God's word and what he's, what he's shown. Inside joke. Yeah. What was it? Big, big engineer guy last time I preached? Because I had an equation up there. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think God, God is good. And he has like perfect timing. And uh, I think he has a perfectly timed message for us today. Um, yeah, I was excited about shadows. I was originally supposed to preach on Job. Um, but our friend Christian, another pastor in training, loves Job. And so I said, hey, why don't you do it? He's like, yes, this will be great. And then he studied for a week straight and was like, this is really hard. I was like, yeah, that's why I gave it to you. <laughs> it was really hard, but he did great. And then I was supposed to preach on Jacob, but Mike was out of town. Um, so here I am with Samson. I think the timing in my own life is really interesting. Oh, okay. I thought there was going to be something up there. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's been like a burdensome few weeks for me. Last weekend, I was involved in a wedding, and uh, we stayed at an Airbnb, and my car got stolen. I have like a 25-year-old Honda Civic that I thought I couldn't pay anyone to steal. I was wrong. Like walked outside. <laughs> There's like five really nice cars, and then there should have been mine, which is not nice, but it was gone. And down the street, I see my same exact car, but it's not mine. They chose to steal mine instead. Um, so went through that, um, a few days later, car turns up a couple miles away. Um, they had just stolen pretty much everything that was in it. My winter coat, uh, baby car seats. Um, they stole one of my climbing shoes, just one, like who does that? Come on. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, it was just a rough week. They found meth in the car and we had to pay to get it clean and, everything. And then that same day, Tuesday, I left for a men's retreat that Rob so lovingly encouraged me to go to with, with Hayden. And uh, I did not know what I was getting myself into because <laughs> that was uh, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, but it was really, really good. It's called Rise Up Kings. And uh, yeah, God just really moved in my heart and uh, just got back yesterday. So I also haven't had as much time to prepare this, but I think God is just on that trip, he really taught me that like the simple truths that I think I know in my head are so much deeper and so much more real than I realize. They have the ability to impact my life in a much bigger way than I give them credit for. And uh, I think he has the same sort of truth for us today. So um, for you people who've been in church, been following God a long time, like I have, um, open your heart today. Like Pray for ears to hear something new, something that God hasn't shown you yet, because I think I've just been astonished at the mystery he's been revealing to me. Um, so we've been in the shadow series, basically walking through the Old Testament. Um, we've been doing just characters in the Bible, starting with Adam and Seth, going all the way down the line, Moses, and now we finally made it to Samson. Um, so the context here. It's basically the people of Israel have been brought out of Egypt. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and then they've been brought into the promised land by Joshua, um, which was preached on last week. And uh, now they're living in the promised land, but they're not at peace. Um, they are basically, they have judges who are their leaders. Um, and these are people that God appoints at different times. Um, and they're, they're really military leaders when it comes down to it, but um, the judges are also kind of reflective of the state of Israel at this time. They, they keep following this cycle of, of sin, punishment for as a consequence for their sin, repentance, deliverance, and then sin again. And the central theme is people just do what is right in their own eyes all the way through the book of Judges. Um, and yeah, you can think of Gideon or Deborah, um, Samson was the last judge before Samuel who helped usher in um, the kingdom with King Saul. Um, so this is kind of like the cherry on top of just this really rough book of, of punishment, of failure, of shortcoming. And we have 
this character who comes in the midst of it and uh, really just echoes that same theme. Um, and it was funny kind of preparing for this. I uh, was trying to research everything I could about Samson and how he was a type of the Christ. And um, I found that scholars and uh, pastors really don't like Samson. They, uh, I remember I was actually in like a, a Bible class, just meeting remotely, and we were going through the whole book of the Bible. Um, and we came to Samson. I remember everyone saying, like, Samson is the worst. This guy is just awful. Like, why is he Why is he in the Bible? Why are we talking about him? And we'll get into it more later, but Hebrews says that he was a man of faith. He is a man of faith. So um, basically, I'm just going to walk us through um, Samson's life and um, kind of catch you up to speed. If you want to follow on your own, it's Judges 13 through 16. I'd highly recommend just reading it straight through. It takes like 15 minutes. So maybe after this, um, yeah, later today, go ahead and, and read. Um, kind of a story because it's really fascinating. But I'll just give you kind of the highlights, the bullet points, and then we can talk about what this all means. Um, so chapter 13, the birth of Samson, it starts off with what I just said. Um, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, the tribe of Danites, whose name was Manoah. His wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So here you have Israel in a desperate situation and they're, they're back under the subjugation of the Philistines, their enemies. So even though they're in the promised land, they're not actually free in the promised land. Um, they've been conquered and, and have no hope. And God, he, he so often likes to do, I see people smiling, okay. Oh, it's because I said big no-no. Anyway. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so God, like he always likes to do, is he takes the underdog and he kind of pulls a victory through something no one was expecting. In this case, it's a, it's a barren woman. Um, and the angel of the Lord appears um, to her and says, you will have a son, therefore do this. So the Nazarite vow, if you guys aren't familiar, it basically comes from Numbers 6. Um, and what was typical for this was the Nazarite vow was optional and it was for a time. It was... Someone saying to God, hey, I, I want to be set apart for you. I want to go the extra mile in, in showing that, like, I'm God's person. And so what you do is you'd, you'd set an amount of time for it. You'd drink no alcohol, not even grapes. You couldn't have anything to do with it. Um, you wouldn't cut your hair, and you would not go near a dead body. And typically, if you even went near a dead body of any kind, you'd have to cut your hair. And that was kind of the end of the vow. Um, so this is a little different because it says, from the womb, Samson will be a Nazarite. And I think it's also cool because um, the Bible is relevant in our culture, and it, its truths, even thousands of years old, can apply to today. Um, this is affirming the sanctity of life here. Samson was a Nazarite even while he was in the womb. He had personhood. He had identity. Um, to the point where his mother had to take on this Nazarite vow while she was pregnant, because otherwise that would have corrupted his vow even before he had taken a breath. So I just think that's really cool um, as a little side note there. Um, and then just a, another little inkling, this angel of the Lord, we'll actually talk about it further in the, in the shadow series, but you'll, you'll notice through the Old Testament, sometimes it will say an angel of the Lord, and sometimes it says the angel of the Lord. And there's good reason to believe that the angel of the Lord is actually Jesus, is actually him meeting physically with these, these people in the Old Testament. And as further evidence of that, um, I'll jump down to verse 17. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. And that word wonderful means like incomprehensible, like you can't even understand my name. Um, we think about what God is called originally, it's Yahweh. It's, it's the Hebrew letters like Y-H-W-H. Um, I think that's what it is. And um, the, the 
Jews wouldn't even speak that name because they considered it so holy, incomprehensible, um, something beyond them. It says, so Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders, and Manoah and his wife were watching. When the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching. And they fell on their faces to the ground. Let's skip down to verse 22. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. And uh, an angel isn't God. <laughs> it might be terrifying like God, but um, I really believe this was, was Jesus meeting with Samson's parents. And so just another urgency to not write off Samson is just a moral failure, but um, God was deeply involved in this man, deeply involved in this family and in, in Israel, even during their time of rebellion. Um, so you skip further down and we know that Samson was born, he grew and he was blessed. Um, it said, the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Um, and this really reminds me of, of what's said of Jesus in Luke 2.52. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So you see Samson kind of growing up with this. He has this calling on his life and the Lord's working in him. The, the spirit is moving in him even from a young age. Um, but we hop into chapter 14 and everything kind of shifts really quickly. Um, Essentially, it starts out, okay, so that's Samson's parents. That's kind of the story of his birth. What, what about him? What does he do? And the first thing we see is Samson says, oh, that Philistine woman, and she is attractive. Go get her for me. I want her to be my wife. A command to his parents. And uh, we don't really understand just um, like how rebellious this is, but... Um, one of the, the consistent commands all the way through the law is do not intermarry with other nations because back then nationality was so closely associated with religion and, and the Philistines were the enemies of the Israelites who were subjugating them. And they worshiped false gods. So to someone who's set apart for, for God, someone who's meant to be the leader, the first action we see him take is one of entitlement, not submitting to his parents saying, hey, you're going to get this person for me because he actually says, she is right in my eyes. There's no regard for her being right in the Lord's eyes. It's just, I want it, give it to me, make it happen. I don't care who this affects. I don't care about the law. I don't care about what God wants. I want that. It's easy to say, oh, well, Samson, he's, he's just the worst. Um, but how many times in our lives have we said, you know what, God, I want this. I don't want to hear what you have to say. I want it and I want it now. Give it to me. And it might be internal. We might almost be convincing ourselves that we don't believe that. But you know, if you're real honest with yourself, there have been times in your life where you said, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to go my own way. And uh, we'll see how that works out for him. Um, so the story gets interesting from there. He goes down to meet with this woman, with his parents. And uh, I guess he was separated, but it says a young lion came roaring toward him. And uh, it says he... He tore the lion in half as, it, as one tears a young goat. I've never torn a young goat like that. Um, maybe that was more of a common thing back then. <laughs> um, either way, it's, uh, it reminds me of David, you know, with the, with the lion and the bear, you know, just, just favor from God and the strength. You'll see Samson had a physical strength that was just from God. It said the spirit of the Lord actually came on him to protect him. So... Um, he kills this lion with his bare hands. Um, he goes and meets with this woman and, and he figures, yeah, she's great. I want to marry her. Um, it says when he actually comes back, he sees the same lion carcass and it's been rotting. This is really strange. He sees this lion and there's honey in the lion. There's like a nest or something and he sees honey. And so, you know, as anyone would do, you see a dead lion that you killed. You see honey in the lion and then you just eat the honey because that's, that's a normal thing. And then he goes and he actually gives it to his parents and doesn't tell them. So, um, yeah, one of the three things of the Nazarite vow, don't go near a dead body. Um, but he actually ate out of a dead body, out of this lion carcass, and then lied about it. Um, it's pretty awful. And, uh, but I think even in that, I'll, I'll share some mini shadows as we're just going through this. Yeah, honey from the lion split open. What the heck does that mean? Why, why is that even in there? 
in this act of disobedience, but you think Jesus was the Lion of Judah. Jesus was killed. He was sacrificed. He died, but from him we can partake in the sweetness of life. Like, crazy. So there's all sorts of little Easter eggs like that um, throughout Samson's story. Um, And again, yeah, that was not just for Nazarite, but there's all sorts of laws about staying away from unclean animals, staying away from dead bodies and corpses, and there was a whole procedure for um, becoming clean again after you had touched that. So um, he's already broken one of his Nazarite vows. Then he goes to this wedding feast. So this is for him to marry this Philistine woman. Um, The Hebrew word for feast there implies alcohol. So it's most likely that already Samson has given up the second part of his vow. He's, He's eating, he's drinking. It says 30 companions were given to him who were all Philistines. And so He's engaging in this culture, um, this, these enemies really of Israel and his parents are involved and um, just a whole mess. Um, but it says God was, God was using it as, as a way to get against the, the Philistines. So it gets weirder. Samson says, you know what, let's, let's play a game. Let's do a riddle. Um, and he says, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. He says, whoever figures out this riddle I'll give 30 pairs of really nice clothes to. If you can't figure it out, then you're going to give that to me. Um, So obviously he was talking about the lion um, that he ate honey out of. Um, But who's going to figure that out? Because that's so weird, right? So they spend a few days trying to figure it out. It's a seven-day wedding feast, and and they can't figure it out. They're really angry. So they go to Samson's um, wife, and they tell her, hey, we need to know, like, what is this riddle? And uh, if you don't, we'll kill you, basically. Um, and so she ends up nagging Samson, nagging, nagging. She says, you don't love me. If you love me, you would tell me. Right? And he says, I haven't even told my own parents. There's no one who knows this. And like a leaky faucet, she just keeps nagging and nagging and nagging. And eventually, he loses it. There's a proverb that says, it's better to live in a desert than with a nagging wife. Um, Samson would agree, although he did not learn from this first woman, as we shall see. So essentially, he, he gives up the riddle. Um, they basically um, tell him, what, what's sweeter than honey? What's stronger than a lion? He says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would have not found out my riddle, which was probably a figure of speech that meant more sense to them back then. Um, but it says, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave their garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. So Samson's super angry. He goes and kills these men. He (laughs) says, here, I gave you your clothes. I killed 30 of your people, but but here are your clothes. And he's so furious that he just, he leaves the wedding feast. He leaves his wife. He goes back to his father's house to cool down. And so they're like, oh, well, he's angry. He's, He's obviously done with this gal. They give him to his best man. Um, so there's some betrayal there. After that, it says he, uh, he went back down to visit his wife um, with a young goat. And his, uh, her father said, no, you can't come in. Um, I've given your wife to another man because I thought you were angry with her. I thought you were angry with us. Um, and the hero's anger is sparked again. He's just so reactive. What does he do? This is where it gets really weird. He's like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go wrangle 300 foxes or potentially jackals. I'm going to tie their tails together. I'm going to light a torch, strap it to their tails, and set them off in the Philistine crops. So I just see like, like, have you ever been so frazzled, so angry that nothing even makes sense? You're like, I'm just going to do something. I'm going to make this happen. So that's what Samson does. How did he do that? I have no idea. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. So maybe, maybe it's like, no, and they just came to him. Um, I'm not sure what kind of knot he used for their tails. Um, I don't think they actually survived, which is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, God uses it and it destroys all these crops of the Philistines. Um, and they freak out. They get really angry and so they burn um, his wife and her father and the whole house to death. Um, and, and that's it. And so you can see tensions are rising between the Philistines and the Israelites. They've been in subjugation for 40 years, but um, now it's, it's starting to spark. It's, it's getting 
um, more heated. And so Samson, um, what does it say? He went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Atom. Um, and the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson to do to him as he did to us. So this is also a theme that you see over and over again in the Old Testament, particularly with Moses and the Israelites. When you, you can be in bondage, but when you first start breaking free from that, um, things typically get better before they get worse. So uh, with Moses, you know, he comes in, he starts confronting Pharaoh. He tells him, you know, this is going to happen. These plagues are going to come on you. And so Pharaoh makes the burden harder for the, the Israelites. And they say, Moses, why have you come? Um, you've made our life miserable. You've, it was better before. So you see the same thing happening here is that even though subjugation wasn't God's plan for the Israelites, they had become almost content in it. It's like if you're living in sin and it just goes on for a long time, you learn to just, well, this is how it's going to be. So I'm, it's not worth the fight. It's not worth the burden. So that's what the Israelites are fe feeling. And so 3,000 of the men of Judah go down to the cleft of the rock in Atom and say to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you've done to us? Um, and he said to them, as they did to me, so I've done to them. And so essentially, um, they basically say, we're going to hand you over. We're not going to kill you. And he's like, okay, tie me up as long as you don't kill me. I'm okay with that. Um, and so essentially, they tie him up with new ropes. They send him over to the Philistines, and he just breaks them. Like, like nothing's going on. Um, he grabs the jawbone of a donkey, again, like one does naturally. <laughs> And it says he struck a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. So again, he's gone near a dead body once again, um, and he kills a thousand Philistines. I think that's numbers like that you read in the Bible. It's hard to actually imagine. Like it's hard to put yourself there because it's just such a crazy number. One man versus a thousand. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers for any friends who might do that men's event, but um, one aspect, it, it was definitely very physical. And I learned that um, when things get physical, they get real. And um, it's just given me a new perspective when uh, the Bible talks about this, like battle is vicious. It is frightening. It is scary. And to think one man killed a thousand without even a weapon, um, that's the Lord's strength. That's him working in Israel against uh, their enemies. And so it says, as, as soon as he had, um, Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. As soon as he was finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand. And he was very thirsty and he called upon the Lord and said, you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant. Shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? So God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi. And water came out from it. He drank. And so Samson's broken God's laws. He's broken his Nazarite vow, but he's used with God's strength to, to make this um, mighty battle for the Israelites. And then afterwards, it's that entitlement again. I'm thirsty, God. Don't you see what I just did? Where's, where's my water? I need water. God says, okay, splits up in the rock, just like he did for the Israelites. So you can see, even in his disobedience, God is there every time. He's there with Samson as he goes through this. So now getting into chapter 16, we're kind of coming to the pinnacle of uh, Samson's life. The um, Really what it's all been leading to. So it says Samson went to Gaza. He saw a prostitute and he went into her. Um, the Gazites were told Samson's here. So they, they circle up and um, they're basically like, this is our chance to get to him. And another thing, you know, with the Israelites doing what is right in their own eyes, this was probably commonplace at that time. Their leader was just acting like the rest of them did. Um, you know, so goes the leader, so goes the rest of um, Israel. And so um, this is really interesting what happens. Samson lay till midnight, it says, and at midnight he, he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. So I looked this up and it's a 40 mile journey from Gaza to Hebron. So you see this, this guy, he's just got this huge city gate. He's just, he's just walking like people are probably like, what's going on? He's just walking. They don't want to mess with him. But 
I see another little shadow here. It says he took the gate to the top of the hill. Well, what did Jesus take to the top of the hill? After he had been lashed 39 times, being ridiculed and mocked, crown of thorns put into his head, it may as well have been 40 miles for Jesus. And the cross is actually our gate into heaven. Wow. Right? That is, Jesus says, I am the way. I am, I am the door for the sheep. So it's just, it's just cool. There's, there's little Easter eggs all the way through here. Um, so, and then it says, that's two women, <laughs> right? Philistines, uh, a prostitute. And it says, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will give you um, 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. So Samson here, he loves this woman. Um, she starts nagging him just like the, the woman before. And um, he kind of plays a game with her. He's like, all right, bind me with seven fresh bowstrings. And then, and then I'll be as weak as any other man. So she does that. She, she calls the Philistines and she says, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he breaks them and he fights them. Um, that wasn't good enough reason for Samson to get rid of this woman. Um, so she, she says to her, tell me the secret. You've mocked me. You've told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. He says, if they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, I'll, I shall become weak, which is also funny because this is what happened before he killed a thousand Philistines. Um, they didn't learn from that either. She does the same thing. Um, it goes one more time. He says, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak like any other man. Um, it's important to know here that um, being stupid doesn't make you sin, um, but being sinful definitely makes you stupid. Samson was unable to wow. see. And I think there's times in our lives when we're just, we're stuck in our ways and we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And it keeps ending up the same way but we're so stubborn that we're unable to see, hey, something's got to change. Hey, we got to get this person out of our life. We got to get this habit out of our life. It's easy to say, ah, he should have known. He should have known better. But we all have had things in our lives that we just keep going back to. And we keep seeing the same thing. We know it's out to get us, but we choose it anyway. So <laughs> she continues um, to just press him and press him. And she says to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times. You have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Um, there's also a weird side note here that um, Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. Keep on asking, keep on knocking, and the door will be opened. Even in the world, even in the worst circumstances, you want something, <laughs> you go after it. And she did, she was, she was committed, she was convinced, and eventually he gave in. Um, again, his strength wasn't in his hair. His strength was in God um, and him setting him apart. Um, but if, if you notice, this is the last of the Nazarite vows that Samson hasn't broken. Um, this is the last little bit of his faith that he has in God in knowing that he's set apart. And, and there's a resistance there, right? He didn't tell her right away. Um, she just ate at him a little bit at a time, just a little further and a little further and a little further. And if we're not willing to do the hard thing and say, ah, we're, I'm cutting this off right here. This is what happens to us. It just gradually, gradually sneaks in, pushes us a little further until Samson finally gets to the point where like, he's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'm done. This is too hard. It's my hair. And so somehow <laughs> he doesn't realize this will happen. But while she's, while he's sleeping, she shaves his head, um, calls the Philistines and they basically come and attack him um, and his strength is gone. The Lord has left him. Um, he's as weak as any other man. Um, there's debate as to whether Samson looked visually intimidating. Um, I think there's good evidence that um, God wanted his power to be known. So maybe he looks like any one of us. Uh, and that's why, wh why the people were so concerned. Where is his power coming from? What can I do? Um, I think that's a really beautiful idea that um, 
you know, man looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. Um, so basically they capture Samson, they gouge out his eyes. Again, let that set in. Like imagine someone gouging out your eyes. <laughs> it's easy to, to read things like that. And, okay, well, he deserved it. But man, can you imagine the pain and the torment? They, they made him a slave. They put him to work grinding in the mill in the prison. Um, and he is at the end of his rope. He <laughs> has lost everything. And uh, there's a verse here. It says, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And so this might be inference a little bit here, but I, I kind of see this as, as a symbol. Hey, your hair has been cut. Your integrity is gone, but it's growing again. Your faith is gone, but it's growing again. I can see like a, a change of heart in Samson where he starts to realize, look what I've done. Look at, look at where my decisions have got me. Um, so it says, you know, they were basically having a party. Um, and they said, ah, they were in high spirits. They said, bring Samson out. He, he can entertain us. We're, we're going to mock him. Um, we get to praise Dagon, their God, for, for handing over um, this enemy of ours. So they bring him out. And uh, it says, Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, let me fill the pillars on which the house rests that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Um, and then Samson calls out to the, to the Lord and says, Please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. So this is the end. This is the end of Samson. He re reaches out to the Lord, and with one mighty act, he brings down um, this building with all his enemies in it. And it's greater than anything he did throughout the rest of his life. And that's it. That's all we hear about Samson. It's only four chapters. And um, honestly, you read this story, and at this point, you're like, okay, so why are we, why are we talking about Samson? Why is, why is he one of our shadows? Why, why do we take the time, a full message, just for him? Um, and the answer lies in Hebrews 11, which I already mentioned. Um, this is known as the Hall of Faith. We've already talked about it a little bit in this series basically just highlights heroes of the Old Testament, really good men, Joseph and Moses and Abraham, people that we've talked about. Um, and it, let's see, in um, Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then later on, um, in verse 32 is when it mentions Samson. Um, one second. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, who were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. So somehow, Samson is listed in the same sentence with King David who Jesus came from, um, who Israel, uh, the city of Jerusalem, is named after, the city of David. Um, Jesus is, is called the son of David. How can he be in the same sentence as this mighty man? Um, it comes back to Hebrews 11.1. 1, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Um, you can see his, his repentance um, in that last statement to God. Really, there was one positive thing Samson did in his entire life. And he says, oh, Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. And he still says that I may be avenged for my eyes. It's still about vengeance for him, but you can see a shift in his attitude here. You can see, remember me. He's poor in spirit. He's lowly. He's humble. He, he doesn't consider himself this great servant anymore to be Used by God, he considers himself as nothing. Don't forget about me, God. I'm still here. Please strengthen me only this once. 
you recognize finally that his strength was not his own. His strength came from God. It's really powerful. And uh, it's intentional. It's intentional that he was put in Hebrews. It's not an accident. I think there's something for us to learn here. Um, so how was Samson a shadow of Christ? Um, number one, this is really cool too, because I think there's, there's very clear shadows in Samson's life, almost the most obvious out of a lot of the people that we've looked at. Um, firstly, Samson and Jesus' births were both miraculous and foretold by an angel. While there are plenty of leaders in the Old Testament, there's only a few where an angel visits their mother and says, hey, you're going to have a child and he'll be set apart. The other one was Isaac with Abraham, right? An angel comes and says, you won't be barren anymore. God has a plan. So just like Jesus, you know, Mary was visited by an angel, said, you, you are going to have a son and he shall be a savior to Israel. Um, number two, Samson and Jesus were both set apart from God's purposes from birth. Um, there's an element of God's sovereignty here that um, he assigns people for his own good purpose. He says, I have a plan for you, and he doesn't force us to do anything. But he says, I'm going to use you regardless of what you do in life. Um, Samson was one of those people, and Jesus was one of those people because God had a plan from the beginning. Number three, Samson and Jesus were given supernatural strength from God and were filled with the Spirit of God. It says both from a very young age, the Spirit of God was in them. Um, you see the same story here. Rob's mentioned it again and again. You read through the Old Testament. You even look at movies that we watch today. It's the same story again and again. and You can see the similarities. Um, number four, Samson and Jesus were both persecuted by their own people. Samson was, was taken by 3,000 of the, of the Israelites, and they said, we're handing you over to the Philistines. Jesus was um, taken by his own people, given to the Romans, and handed over to death. Um, number five, Samson and Jesus were betrayed by someone close to them over pieces of silver, nonetheless. Wow. They say, Delilah, we'll give you the silver, betray Samson over to us. Same thing with Judas. Judas will give you the silver, betray Jesus over to us. And number six, by sacrificing their lives, both Samson and Jesus accomplished far more for the kingdom in their death than in their life. So while Jesus came and he taught and he spoke and he healed people and he gave us a whole new way to look at the world, he ushered in the kingdom of God. It was through his last action, his death on the cross, his resurrection, that's his most lasting impact. And honestly, if Jesus hadn't done that, if he had said no to the cross, we wouldn't be talking about him today. If he hadn't backed up what he said with action, it wouldn't have mattered. That's another thing I learned at, at this men's retreat. It's, it's easy to talk. It's easy to talk the talk and not walk the walk. But when, when you're staring death in the face, when Jesus was waiting for the cross, that's when it, it got real, right? That's when his love truly showed. And that's, that's why he's the most famous man to have ever walked the earth. That's how we know that he was God, because he was willing to do that. Um, in the same way, I think Samson's life is such a mess that we can look at this final action of his and, and think that it was still cowardice, right? As he's, just, he's just letting go. He's just going to kill himself with the rest of the Philistines. I don't think we realize that there was a shift, like that was a sacrifice. Samson was at the end of his rope, and he realized, man, I, I'm going to give everything. I'm going to give the last bit that I have for God, even if it costs me his life. Think about how that prayer could have looked differently. He could have said, Lord, strengthen me one more time that I may escape the Philistines, that I may go back to my old life. He says, no, I understand there's consequences for my sin, but I'm still willing to be used by you right now. Really powerful. So, um, Man, clear shadows, really cool. Um, how is Jesus better than Samson, though? A, a shadow, we, we talk about it almost every time. You can see a physical option, object, and then you can see its shadow. It gives you an idea, but it's not the full picture. It's not, yeah. not the fullness. The, the shadow of this, this table is not the same as the table itself. Um, so you can see here, Samson was born of a woman who was barren. Jesus was born of a virgin, <laughs> right? So a barren woman, that's a miracle. Lord brings life. He's Lord over the womb. He is sovereign. Um, but 
a virgin, someone who physically should not be able to in any way bear a child. Jesus takes it a step further and he says, I will guarantee you that um, my works are miraculous. Wow. Number two, Samson was set apart as a Nazarite. Jesus was set apart as a Nazarene. Wait, that's not right. Naz- Nazarene. Jesus was from Nazareth. It's different than being a Nazarite, just so you know. Um, the shadow really is Jesus was set apart as God himself, perfectly sinless. Um, so in taking this Nazarite vow, part of it was, hey, I want to be like God. Not in a way that Satan wanted to be like God, not to rule over people, but to be set apart. Hey, I want to look different from the world. So I'm not going to drink like the world does. I'm not going to be focused on death like the world is. I'm not going to even look physically like the rest of the world does because I'm going to have this long hair. It's saying, hey, this is separate. There's something different working in this person. And there was the same thing in Samson. And you see the same thing with Jesus. He, he came and while he was in the world, he was fully human. He was a person who experienced all the things that we experienced. He was set apart. He was given a mission. He was given a task. Um, it's easy to understand this when you think about where Jesus came from, right? He's the king of heaven and earth. He's sitting on the throne, living in eternal majesty, right? And he chooses, hey, I'm going to come down to this earth and I'm going to do the work. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to accomplish this mission, right? And so sometimes I think about how silly would it be if Jesus came down and he uh, just really strive to, to create wealth for himself, right? That, that wouldn't really make sense because he has riches in heaven. He's king above everything. It wouldn't make sense for him to be striving after that. It wouldn't make sense for Jesus to strive after pleasure while he was on earth because he had pleasure forever in the kingdom. Like why? That wouldn't make any sense. Um, but you realize we do the same thing. We have treasure in heaven. We have eternal majesty that's waiting for us. Um, so what are we going to do? Are we going to choose to be set apart? Are we going to choose to do the hard things that the world's not willing to do so we can look different? Does your life say that you're set apart? Do people look at your life and say, why do you, why do, you do that? I've, that doesn't make sense to me. Why do you give so generously like that? Why are you at peace when all of us are anxious about work? Why aren't you losing your mind over what's happening in the world? We're set apart. We have peace. We're with God. We know he has a plan. Um, Here's another reason. Samson was given supernatural physical strength from God, yet Jesus was given supernatural spiritual spiritual strength. Um, In 1 Timothy 4.8 says, physical training is of some value. It's good. But training in godliness is far more valuable. It's eternal at last. And so I love that verse because it says, yeah, physical training is good. Don't neglect your body. Don't neglect your health. Um, but set what's most important first, training and godliness. And so you see this, this physical strength of Samson as the shadow of God's strength, right? God is mighty. He's a warrior. He is powerful. He's capable. And he's involved in the physical. He wants you to be physically healthy. He wants to bring a physical victory for the Israelites in, in the Old Testament. But Jesus one-ups it. He says, okay, that physical victory is good. That physical strength is good, but I have something better. I'm going to give you spiritual strength. And now, just like Jesus had, we have access to that spiritual strength through the Father. Um, I also mentioned how both Jesus and Samson um, walked in the Holy Spirit, right? It says the Holy Spirit and dwelt them. Um, You'll see that through the Old Testament. Sometimes, you know, certain people, Samson and David, says the the Holy Spirit came upon them. How cool is it that we have a promise, a guarantee that the Holy Spirit indwells all of us? We have access to God. It's amazing. It was very limited in the Old Testament, people who got to do that. Um, One more, Samson submitted to the persecution, knowing there would be a way to escape bondage. Yet Jesus submitted to persecution, knowing there would be a way to escape death itself. So Jesus says, hey, or Samson says, hey, you can, you can tie me up. That's fine because I know I'm going to be able to break those bonds. I'm going to escape and I'll be able to, to fight. I'll use this strength that God's, God's given me. Um, Jesus says, you can hand me over and not even death can contain me. Wow. He says, I don't care if I'm bound. I don't care if I'm killed. I know God is faithful. You see that step up once again. 
Um, Samson sought revenge against those who were his enemies. Yet Jesus, in his dying breath on the cross, forgave, forgave his killers. Um, this is also more real for me now, too. Part of um, this whole men's event that I was, I was a part of was, you know, you have these coaches, and they've been through it. They've done it before, and, and their job is to break you down. Their job is um, to give you this experience where you, you come to the end of yourself. And early on, like, <laughs> they're pretty mean. They're really stern. They, they got straight faces, and um, it's hard what they make you go through. And, and it's funny, even subconsciously, you're like, you're my enemy. I, I don't like what you're making me do right now. Um, it's just such a small taste of the, just the feelings of betrayal, the hatred that most of us would have for those that made us suffer. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If Jesus can say that on the cross, who, who can we look at in our lives and say, God, don't forgive them. <laughs> They've done too much against me. No, Jesus sets the standard all the way. All the way. And one more, Samson's sacrifice brought a physical victory over the Philistines. That lasted for a time. But Jesus' sacrifice brought a spiritual victory over sin, death, and the devil, and that will last for eternity. Um, and we're going through Ecclesiastes in my house church right now, which I love that book, <laughs> as you guys know. Um, but it, it really points to this same idea over and over again, that the physical is fleeting. Like life is fleeting, wealth is fleeting, pleasure is fleeting. It's all vanity, right? I keep saying it's a mist. It goes away. And so you see this again and again all the way through the Bible. The, the Israelites are redeemed. They're saved out of Israel. The Red Sea is lo- literally parted after 10 plagues. And weeks later, they're saying, God, you should have left us in Egypt. The food was better back there. <laughs> like, they're human, just like us. It, it's fleeting. And you see in Judges, all right, there's a victory. Yes, God has saved his people. And a few more years goes by. We're back in the pit, back in the trenches. They're back in subjugation. They're back in sin. It lasted for a time. It was temporary. It was temporal. It was, it was physical. But Jesus, he did something that will never pass away, something whose significance only increases as time goes on. Only more people are saved. It's something that will not pass away. His word will not pass away. Our souls will not pass away. So when the physical thing feels so tempting, when you want one more drink or or when you want to turn to comfort, just remember this is going to pass. It really doesn't satisfy. The Bible doesn't tell us that just just because you should or you shouldn't. It genuinely wants the best for us. These things, they don't last. But Jesus gives us something that will last. Jesus says, I have a well that will never run dry. And he who drinks will never be thirsty again. Do we really believe that? Or is it just something we like to talk about? So lastly, how can our lives point to Christ like Samson's did? And again, I read commentaries and um, study Bibles. And, and some of these guys are like, ah, Samson, he's just a mess. There's no way this guy pointed to Christ. The whole point is just to say how messed up the Israelites were. But I don't think that's the case. I think Samson's there for a reason. I think he was the last judge of Israel before Samuel for a reason. He was in Hebrews for a reason. And it's to give us hope. Um, one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians twelve nine. Paul's talking about this thorn in his flesh, and he's, he's asked God to take this thorn away. And, and God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. What a great verse to sum up Sam, um, Samson's life. My grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. Um, another really cool part of this men's event is um, you know, 20 different guys from all different walks, all different faith backgrounds. Um, there's an event where you, you go to the foot of the cross and you lay it all out there. What do I need to get off my chest? <laughs> what does nobody know about me that I just, I can't hold it in any longer? And these guys just messed up things. Just honesty, 
come fully. Lord, you can have this. I'm done holding this. Please forgive me. And what was astonishing is every single person had icky, awful stuff. Every, every one of them. Good men. One of, one of these guys I was with um, actually did the same nine-month mission trip that I did a year before and knows a lot of the same people. He's given his life to the Lord. We all have mess. We have stuff that we're hiding, stuff that keeps us up at night. What if we were willing to just believe God when he says, my grace is enough? It's enough. How can we look at Samson's life and, and think that he had something great to offer in and of himself? What fruit can we see on his life? There's none. He makes mistake after mistake after mistake. He's selfish. He's entitled, but God is with him in every step. God is with you in your sin. He's with you in your rebellion. He's there. Are we willing to believe that his grace is enough? His grace is enough. Repeat that to yourself until it sinks in, until you really believe it. His grace is sufficient for you. How else? Believe like Samson that it's never too late to turn back to God. Think of the sinner on the cross. You know, <laughs> he's at the end of his rub too. He's at the end and um, the other um, criminal is mocking Jesus. Everyone's mocking Jesus. And, and he's reached the end of himself. And he says, I want to be with you in paradise. He says the same thing. Please remember me. Are you willing to go low? Are you willing to get on your knees? Wow. Lord, remember me. I know I'm nothing. I know I'm dirt. I'm a worm. Just don't forget about me. The Bible says, a broken and contrite spirit, the Lord will not despise. Yes. It's not too late. God's not done with you. He has a plan for your life. And even if that plan only lasts 30 seconds more for you to die on a cross or for you to, <laughs> like Samson, bring a victory for your people, God can still use you. Um, one thing that was said a lot this week was, um, are you willing to let your mess become your message? You, you see this all throughout the Bible too. You see Paul persecuting Christians, killing them, imprisoning them, going from place to place with this zeal, um, this, this cruelty. And God used that. God used him more powerfully than anyone else in the New Testament because of this mess that he came out of. Um, but the temptation there is to say, oh, I don't really have a mess. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm a, I'm a good person. Um, you're only cheating yourself, and you're cheating God. Be honest about what you've been through, what you're going through, and God can turn it around. He can use it. And Samson's one action, which still had a, a tinge of selfish ambition, right? I want vengeance for my eyes. That put him in the word of God. I put him in Hebrews as an emblem of faith forever. We can look at him and say he was a man of faith. That's all it took, which brings me to number three. God can use even a mustard seed of faith. Seed. Well, okay, is that's like a? It must mean something else, right? It's like maybe it's a big seed, or may, maybe maybe means no. God can use this much. Are you willing to give him what you have, even if it's not very much? I love how Micah says, you know, be hungry for God. And if you're not hungry, be hungry to be hungry, right? Lord, I don't want you, but I want to want you. Yes. Help me want you. Yes. Give him what you have, even if it feels like nothing. Um, that's all you can give. Another thing about this, this retreat is each person has only what they can give. They don't want you to meet some expectation. Hey, you have to run this fast or accomplish this much. They just want you to push as far as you can. They want you to do the best that you possibly can. And that's all that matters. You don't have to compare yourself to someone else. You don't have to think, oh, well, he's doing it better. God just wants you for you. So are you willing to give him what you have, even if it feels like it's nothing? Samson was at the end of his life. He said, I'm here. Use me how you want to. Number four, believe that God can use you in your brokenness for his purposes. Um, we don't need to have 
just a perfect, clean life in order to be used, used by God. In fact, I don't know if you guys, you guys have noticed this, but there's some pastors I've met and some people I've met who um, they'll smile all the time. They smile when they're preaching. I'm like, that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> You know, they're, they're, they won't pop a joke, you know? It's like, are you, are you human? What's going on? It's, it's the people who are authentic, who are real about their mess, about their brokenness. That's who I can relate to. I, I can understand. We're human. And Jesus was actually like this. It says he, he cried out to God with wailings and loud tears. Hebrews says that um, the high priest was meant to be someone who can empathize with human weakness. Someone who is bound to the same shortcomings and weaknesses. Jesus is a good high priest because he gets it. He gets us. I love the chosen because it just shows us again and again. Jesus is human. He's not on high saying, oh, how dare you think that? How dare you do that? He's saying, I understand. But there is a better way. There is a better way. So let God use you in your brokenness and call it what it is. Be willing to come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in time of need. Be willing to be honest with yourself and where you're at. Whatever it is, God can take it. I I saw some men come out of some dark things this week, and they stand taller. They have a twinkle in their eye when it was just depression before. They're new men. They truly are. And so are you willing to to cower in fear based on what you've done and lose out on what God can have for you? Or are you willing to humble yourself and say, here it is, God, I'm exposed. Here it is, brother. Here it is, pastor. Here it is, wife. This is who I am. But I'd rather you know me fully and get this off my chest than hold this in and and convince myself that I'm something that I'm not. There is so much freedom in that. There is so much freedom and there is so much grace. Um, and out of that, be willing to act on your belief, even at great sacrifice like Samson did. You know, there, there's the question of the sinner on the cross, right? It says, um, those who do not bear fruit will be thrown into the fire. So they say, oh, well, what about him? He, he didn't have any fruit, right? He just died. It's like, well, what if he survived? What if he survived the cross? What if Samson survived this event? What if he came out of it? I guarantee you he'd be a different person. I guarantee you, God could use him in new ways and in different ways. It's like true faith comes from repentance. And repentance says, my way doesn't work. God, I want your way. I want to do things your way because mine doesn't work. Are you willing to actually do what it takes to show that to God? It's not saying works. It's not saying strive to be good enough or, <laughs> or be enough. I argue with my Catholic friends about this all the time. Um, salvation comes from faith and works will follow. It's not faith plus works that gives you salvation, um, but be willing. A lot of hard, hard things I went through this week that I had the option to say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. This is too much for me. Um, be courageous. Be courageous. The king of heaven is living inside of you. He has a plan for you. So don't cower back. He is giving you everything you need to accomplish what he has for you. He's given you enough to get by a day at a time. Give us our daily bread, right? It's, it's not too much for you. It's not too much. Be willing to lay your life down. Be willing to carry your cross. And I guarantee you when you're in that, when you're in the suffering, when you're in the suck and it's painful, like, God, I don't know where you are. There's a peace that comes, and it doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away the suffering, Um, but there's a special comfort that you can experience, and I experienced this week, but you're not going to experience that comfort if you're not willing to go through the pain, if you're not willing to, to do what God's asking of you. So be willing to act on your belief, even if it costs you your life, every single day. Action follows faith. And one final thing I think we can learn from Samson is repent. Be willing to repent before the consequences of your sin cost you everything. What if Samson had repented long before this moment? What kind of leader could he have been for the Israelites? God had set him apart. God had a plan. 
What if, what if his story looks like David's? It could have. It could have been hugely impactful. And it, you know, it says at the beginning, he will begin to save Israel. Because that's all it was. He began saving Israel. He didn't save Israel. But what would a humble heart have looked like before? Are you willing to look at your life and say, oh, this is messy enough. I don't want this to get any worse. I want your way, God. I don't, I don't want to learn the hard way. And I, I think there's humility to be found here because God has to break people down to get them to this point. Where is your line going to be? How far do you have to go before you realize that God's way is better? I think we get to choose. For some people with hard hearts, it has to, it has to be everything, right? With Pharaoh, it was his very own child who had to be taken from him before he would humble his heart. So are you willing to say, ah, oh, this is enough mess? God, I want your way. I don't want to see any more of this. I've seen enough. Um, be willing to repent and go low. Um, yeah, so that's all I have for us. Um, be encouraged. His grace is sufficient. It's enough to help in time of need. And uh, Samson is a hero of the faith, even though he only had a mustard seed of faith. Uh, so I'm just going to pray for us. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you get us. Thank you that you understand. You're a gracious and compassionate God. And you're active and present in our lives, even when it's messy, even when it's ugly, even when it's painful, you're still there. You're still there. So give us faith, God. Um, help us to go low, to repent. Help us to let the skeletons out of the closet, to be willing to risk the good life we think we have for the great life that you want to give us. Um, Lord, give us courage and boldness to follow you, even if it costs us our own lives. And help us not to be like the older brother of the prodigal son. Say, oh, no, he's done everything wrong. He shouldn't be, be let back in. Why are you throwing a feast for him? I think you threw a feast for Samson when he turned back to you. So help us celebrate those who maybe have no fruit but have a humble heart and help us lead them in the way of God. Lord, just be with us. Give us more and more of your grace. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you.